all new today. From Little Princess to Celebrity Scandal. Tabloids dubbed her the wife swap booker. Alicia is getting a heavy dose of reality. Straight up, are you a prostitute? Absolutely not. You're at a rest stop with an older man. Why did you tell the police you were getting five to $700 to have sex with him? What happened that night? I was blacked out drunk. You should not mix alcohol with prescription medication. You knew that. How is that Mr. Doyle's fault? He should have cut me off. Is she to blame for her behavior? She was addicted to prescription medication, you packed it up in tiny baggies to fit in her purse. The exclusive interview with Alicia and her mother. You were dancing at a gentleman's club. Were you okay with that? I drive her there and pick her up. Let's do it. Why don't we stop all the drama, stop all the fighting, and let's go get you better. Here we go. Have a good show, everybody. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, three, take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Alicia Gustafaro first made headlines at 15 years old when her family was featured on a 2008 episode of ABC's Wife Swap. Viewers were shocked to see Alicia getting spray tanned by her dad, her parents doing her homework, and her mom tucking gifts beneath a year-round Christmas tree so she could celebrate Christmas every day. <laughs> every day. But now, five years later, Alicia says she's not the spoiled brat people saw on TV. She also says that what started out as a fun family adventure ended up ruining her entire life. Take a look. Growing up, my parents always said I was their little princess. We spoiled Alicia. She had the nicest clothes, just going places, doing things. I was spoiled. My parents did give me a lot of gifts. This dress cost about $3,800 to make. <laughs> I absolutely loved participating in beauty pageants. I felt like a princess. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate Alicia Gustafiro. I feel Alicia was very privileged and could get a lot of things that other people couldn't get. I did win a lot of pageants. This is one of my favorite crowns. I won the Ultimate Superstar Grand Supreme. Many crowns, medals, and banners, and trophies. When I was taking dance classes, my dance teacher approached the class one day saying, do any of you want to maybe be on a reality show called Wife Swap? Before I knew it, the people from Wife Swap called us, and when they finally accepted us to be on Wife Swap, why not? You know, it sounded fun. On the show, people made me out to be this bratty, spoiled, stupid, dumb blonde, which I am nothing of the sort. The show said, we have a tree up to give Alicia Christmas every day. That's not true. Yes, I have a Christmas tree up every day, but it's in memory of my grandmother. After she passed away, I couldn't take down the Christmas tree. On the show, they went to the point of actually giving me a little gift, wrapping it up, and putting it under the tree, and having me open it, and saying, oh, look, Mama, what did I get today for Christmas? And obviously, at the time I was 15 years old, I thought, oh, my God, this is Hollywood. This is awesome. Maybe I'll be a movie star. After the show aired, the next day, I was the most hated person. It literally changed my life overnight. People were sending me hate mail, stalker letters, cherry bombs in my mailbox. It went as far as actually hate crimes. I went through living hell. It just still continues, the hate and what people think of me. I'm a real person. You cut me, I bleed, and words can really hurt. Being on a reality show was the worst mistake of my life. Hmm. Was that really the worst mistake of Alicia's life? Fast forward to this past August, just a few days shy of Alicia's 21st birthday, she found herself back in the headlines in a big, big way. TMZ and other tabloids dubbed her the wife swap hooker. 
when state troopers arrested Alicia at a highway rest stop in a running car, passed out cold, and slumped over a man old enough to be her father. Now, Alicia told the cops the man regularly paid her for sex. She told the cops. Take a look. When I first met Jimmy, I was 19 years old. He was in his 50s. He made me feel like a little princess. Two weeks before my 21st birthday, he said, let's celebrate your birthday just a little bit earlier. I go, Jimmy, I'm not 21 yet. He went to this Italian restaurant. I had three pomegranate martinis. After dinner, he said, let's go to a bar. At the bar, I had a shot of whiskey and two pomegranate martinis. I take prescription medication. The use of alcohol amplifies the medication extremely. After the bar, I said, Jimmy, I got to go home. I am drunk. Let's go home. As we were driving, I was blacked out drunk. I heard horns. I opened my eyes. I saw two semis coming right at me. I'm thinking this must be a bad dream. I shut my eyes. I felt the swerve in the road. I opened my eyes. We were at a rest area. I shut my eyes and was blacked out drunk again. I woke up to the state troopers pounding at my door. I looked to my left. Jimmy is passed out on the steering wheel. I was in a daze. I'm thinking this can't be happening right now. A case involving a Rochester lawyer found asleep in his car with a 20-year-old prostitute. That night, I was charged with being a prostitute, criminal impersonation, and having controlled substances. Apparently, the state troopers, seeing I was at a rest area, thought I was a prostitute. I was charged with criminal impersonation due to the fact that I had a fake ID. I was charged with the possession of controlled substances because that night, my mother actually put my prescription medication in a little pink mint container. I was charged for having close to 12 different substances in my purse. The night I got arrested was a nightmare. Okay, now, first off, tell me why you wanted to be here today. I want to be here Hopefully, so you can help me give it, let people know I need a second chance in the world. I'm not the two tabloids. I'm not what people say I am. I'm a real person. And you want to get your side of the story out. Correct. And, I, and that's what I want you to do. And I'm going to give you the chance to do that. And when we're through, I'm going to ask you, did I give you the chance to do that? Because that's what I intend to do. I appreciate that Because I think much. you deserve to get... And you understand why people are confused, though. Absolutely. Um, are you, straight up, are you a hooker? Absolutely not. You're not a prostitute. I am not a prostitute. You don't sell your body for money. Absolutely not. And you, you understand why the headline said that, because the arrest report says that when they kind of came up and started banging on your window, mm -hmm. and, you know, first off, the circumstances, and, and I do have a lot of compassion for this because I have kids, and I've got them, one about your age, a little older, but about your age, and I always say, you know, a, avoid the appearance of impropriety. Um, you're at a rest stop with an older man, passed out in a car, and you've got drugs with no prescriptions on you, and they bang on the door, and they ask you what you're doing there, and you say, they say you're crying. This is what they say. This is what they, they report. They, they say, come on, Alicia, what else does he pay you? You say, according to them, crying, he gives me five to seven hundred dollars to spend the night. They say five to seven hundred dollars a night to consummate? I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. For sexual favors. Yeah, we have sex. Five to seven hundred dollars he gives me. How often does that happen? Oh, he calls me a couple of times a month, and we have sex for five to seven hundred. Were you already paid? He pays me in the morning. So that's what is in the police report. So based on that being released to the press, that's why people felt like they could report that you were selling your body for money. Now, what's the rest of that story? Well, the true story is I met Doyle, Jimmy Doyle, when I was 19, year old, 19 years old bartending. He appeared to be this wonderful gentleman. Little did I know he would be a nightmare. 
He was nothing but evil, lies, told me whatever I wanted to hear. And I would like to clear the record that I am not a prostitute. I think anywhere... Why, why did you say this to the police? First of all, I am on prescription medication. You should not mix alcohol with my prescription medication. And that intensifies the alcohol so much more. You knew that? I did know that. But you drank anyway? I did. I thought... So how is that Mr. Doyle's fault? Isn't that your responsibility? I should have had more responsibility towards it, but I thought, seeing he's a lawyer, he should have more ethics. Why shouldn't he have stopped me? He says, your 21st birthday, I'll take care of you. Soon to be your 21st birthday, I'll take care of you. Well, having a law license doesn't change the potentiation effect of alcohol on prescriptions. And you're the one that had the prescriptions. I mean, so aren't you responsible for managing your own body and medications and... That is correct. But in previous times, my mother has actually told him she has medication. She takes it this time, this time, and this time. He should have cut me off because after one drink, I was feeling loopy. And he sh should have known better. I was 20 years old at the time. He was 54 years old. Yeah. Why did you tell the police you were getting five to seven hundred dollars to have sex with him a couple times a month? First of all, I was blacked out drunk. I have no recollection of anything I said that night. If you're just going to make something up, why tell them I get five to seven hundred dollars a night for having sex instead of the score to the last three Super Bowls or something? <laughs> why that? Why make that up? If you're going to make something up out of the blue, why make that up? I heard when I drink, I can be very repetitive, and I can make a fool of myself, and... But why that with fact to make up? I think the only way five to seven hundred dollars a night came up because at the time I was an exotic dancer, and I was making up to five to seven hundred dollars a night, and they took maybe coercion that five to seven hundred dollars, oh, a dancer, the age difference, all right, she is a prostitute. All right, all right, we have to take a break. All right, next, Alicia's mom's going to join us. Karen says she'd do anything to help her daughter be the best. And that includes paying $15,000 to rig a beauty pageant so Alicia could win and driving her to work so she could exotic dance to earn money for the family. We'll be right back. <laughs> I started off doing local pageants, and then it progressed to doing national beauty pageants. Once or twice a month, we'd be traveling on the plane. I won numerous amounts of pageants in this dress. At one point, my mother and father paid a pageant director $15,000 just to make sure I'd win a beauty pageant. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Her shocking accusations. My mom's boyfriend started molesting me at age eight and then fathered three of my children. Rocks this small town. He is not the monster that we're having this picture painted of. If a 33-year-old man was impregnating your 15-year-old daughter, are you okay with that? Why doesn't anyone believe her? If it was happening, why not tell your mom, your friend, anybody? You're blaming the victim, and that's absolutely absurd. Tomorrow. Then on Monday. I didn't date you. You're a booty call that got pregnant. This isn't a home. You call her names in front of your children. It's a war zone. There's a reason behind the madness, and it's right in front of you. That's Monday. My parents are felons. They have a lot of problems with the law. In May 2009, my house was bombarded by FBI agents and Homeland Security. They completely raided the house. My dad was charged with money laundering. Before he left for jail, he told me, no matter what it takes, support the family. My mother was on house arrest. I had to step up a notch, providing food on the table and making sure all the bills were paid. And I started to be an exotic dancer because the money was better. My parents actually drove me there to make sure I'd be on time for work. My parents supported me 1,000%. Alicia Gustafaro says reality TV ruined her life, but did her family's dysfunction 
also play a part. Now, Alicia's mom joins us now, and Karen says she's desperate to help her daughter get her life back on track. Now, of course, my question always to every family and every set of parents is, what's their ownership in it? Are they part of the problem? Can they be part of the solution? Alicia says there were times that her mom was the one driving her to her job as an exotic dancer at a gentleman's club when she was just a teenager. Um, now, let me, let me ask you all something. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I have two goals here. Okay. One is you want to get your side of the story out so Correct. people understand that you're a human being with feelings and a side of the story. And I said I want you to get that, that story out. And the other is if you're doing things that I think as an individual or a family are getting in your way of getting on a healthy track now or in the future, I want to tell you what they are. You don't have to agree with them, but I'll tell you so you can decide whether you want to do them or not. Um, which is why I'm glad parent is here, mom is here. Um, do you um, do you think you have ownership in some of the problems that she's had and is having in her life? I definitely feel I have a lot of um, influence of what happened to her. Not that you would yes. intend it. I don't no, mean that, of course. But do you think you've contributed to her problems? Yes, I do, because with my husband and myself having legal problems, it really put a strain <clears throat> on her. And you, you detest the word stripper. Yes. Uh, but you, you prefer exotic dancer. Yes. And gentlemen's club instead of strip club. Yes. Uh, which is fine with me. Um, but you, you were dancing at a gentleman's club yes. as an exotic dancer. What age did you start doing that? I started bartending at 18. I started dancing at 19 years old. Okay. Um, were you okay with that? Well, at first I thought she was bartending and she was bringing home all this money. I go, wow. Must be a really, really nice. good. Yeah, really. Pouring some really good drinks. I guess some really good tips. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you couldn't have believed that very long. Not really. And once you found out that she was not bartending, but in fact disrobing in front of a room full of drunken men, mm -hmm. how did you feel about it? I felt, you know, is it a safe environment? And um, I, knew I'm sorry? I didn't think it was that safe of an environment. At first, I thought what type of people hang out there. But she assured me that, you know, they always have, they always have security and they're protected. And um, some people are nice, some aren't. And she was bringing a lot of money home. And uh, I drive her there to make sure that she'd arrive safely and pick her up. So as long as nobody was physically attacking her, right. I mean, there was security there, right. then, and the money was pretty good, then mm -hmm. you were basically okay with it? Basically, yeah. Wow. Um, did, did it concern you that your lovely daughter that was a wonderful student and talented in so many ways um, was choosing that particular career path? Did you think that was perhaps beneath her or in some way um, exploitive or that it might reflect in some way that she was lacking in I don't know, well, self-esteem, judgment, self-worth, mm -hmm. that it was okay with her, uh, the, well, the willingness to do that? Well, I thought it wasn't the most respectable occupation, obviously. But you said you were okay with it. I was okay with it, and... Um, wow. D did you wish at some point that somebody would step up and say, no, you're not going to do that, you're better than that? In the back of my mind, yes. But my father always told me, no matter what, I need to support the family, and I took the initiative to do whatever it takes to support the family. That was his word, support the family, support the family. Blood is thicker than water. And I became the sole supporter of the family. Wow, did, did you think it might be taking a toll on her? I did, I mean, she worked a lot of hours and- um... Well, I don't mean the hours, I mean- <laughs> No, no, it's just, it's the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> A 54-year-old man wants to go out with your 20-year-old daughter. What do you think he wanted to discuss? I don't know, constitutional briefs? 
after your brief. You had no moral issues with her dancing. I, I probably did, basically. I just, I couldn't show it. I was like numb to the whole thing with my husband being away. Where, where is he just, now? He's home. He's home in Buffalo. He's not here Buff today, though. No, he's home in Buffalo, New York. Yeah, why is he not here today? He's uh, on home confinement. Right. They, the so he's still in the confinement? Right. Yes. Probation, probation doesn't want him on TV. Yeah. Obviously. Hmm. And, um,. See, I, I think, um, see, I, I, I've, I've written a book about this, actually, called Life Code. I don't suppose you've read that. I would love for you to get a copy. Um, I'll give you a copy, because I, I talk about parenting in there. And in this book, you know, I, I say that we have to have a code to get through our lives, particularly with the worlds changing. And I worked on this with my son, Jay, who actually published it. And we, we talk about how the world has changed so much, how kids are getting pushed along so fast. And you know, I, I talk about that our job as parents is to prepare our children for the next level of life. Mm -hmm. Like if they're little kids not going to school yet, we gotta prepare them for school. And if they're in school, we gotta prepare them to go out into the world. And, mm -hmm. We got to prepare them to know that there are bad people out there and how to spot them and stay away from them and, and how to protect themselves at all times and how to do all the things they need to do. And if we don't see the world for what it is, then we can't pass that on to our children. And you know, I, I'm looking at the things that you knew exactly. as a mother. I mean, you knew that she was dating a 54-year-old man when she was 20. And, and you were okay with that? Well, when we met him, uh... He was very nice. He took my husband and myself. He was 54. Him. She was 20. I understand. Well. And you, you can't see around corners at 20, but you can. Right. I didn't think it was the best uh, thing. You told your mom that the 54-year-old attorney was interested in you. You Googled him to confirm he was a lawyer, but you had no problem with her seeing him, right? Well, when it first started out, I didn't think that they would see each other long, just take her to a, a political dance and just um, dinner. And after a while, you know, he'd invite us over to his house, my husband and myself, take us to the casino, take us to dinner. Okay, well. a 54-year-old man wants to go out with your 20-year-old daughter, yes. and you think that he wants to do that because why? I'm just asking. I'm just curious what well, your thought was. Obviously, for Why did you reasons. think he wanted to go out with you? I was in such a daze of everything between my father going to jail, my parents being felons, my house being raided, being bullied. I didn't know what to think. What did you think he wanted to discuss, I don't know, constitutional briefs or your briefs? I mean, what, you, <laughs> what, what did you think? I was naive. I'm going to admit that. Um, I always learned that age is a number. You are either interested or you're not, or you're strong or you're weak. I thought he was interested. I was naive. I was stupid. And I fell into his lies. I believed him. That's the sad part. OK, well, OK, so you dated 54. Your old man when you were 20, and you allowed it. He was an attorney that was interested in her. He said it was okay. He said he was staying out gambling with a 54-year-old friend. You allowed it. She worked at a gentleman's club when under 21. You drove her there. She was addicted to prescription medication. You packed it up in tiny baggies to fit in her purse. Did, did, did you ever think that maybe Obviously, it wasn't the right choice. I make bad choices. It's just the idea. I was in a, a daze. Everything that's happened. See, I, I don't think that your medications are like a party thing for you. I, I think you've been prescribed mm -hmm. medications that have gotten a grip on you. Absolutely. I don't think. I, I, don't, I mean, some people may think, that, oh, party girl, give me some drugs. No, I don't no. think that's at all what has happened with Not you. Not at all. Because I've done my homework, and I, I've seen... The things that have been prescribed to you, we'll talk about them in a minute. Uh, my God, uh, Valium, Paxil, Ritalin, Flexeril, Lortab, Ambien, uh, Lamictal, uh, th these things. And, and no, when was the last time you had your blood drawn to check levels to, to determine if, if these are toxic or appropriate for you? Never did. Holy. <laughs> 
Okay, we, we reached out to James Doyle, but we did not get a response. Uh, we're going to take a break, and I'm going to come back and uh, tell you what I think. Um, Alicia says she's ready to put the negative and the haters behind her. Uh, I am neither negative nor a hater uh, with this young lady, but there is one big dark cloud still looming over uh, what I hope is a very bright future for her. We'll be right back. <laughs> This one keeps me happy. This is her pain. Another pill, another day, another problem. Under the influence of drugs and alcohol, at least she's made a lot of poor decisions. Being on Y Swap was the worst mistake of my life. I have never been so hurt, so bullied. I was pushed into lockers, had my books pushed off the desk, called any name you could ever think of, food thrown at me, my senior prom. I did not even have a date. I had to pay a guy that I met at the gym to be my prom date. I had no friends. I was bullied to a point where people actually called me fat. I have thunder thighs. I could never wear a mini skirt again. I felt so humiliated. I actually was anorexic. I went from 135 to 94 pounds in less than four weeks. I was hospitalized for seven days. Then after that, oh my God, your parents are felons. Your parents are felons, felons. How much can a person take? It was a living nightmare. And this feels like it'll never end. It's just a bad dream. Well, Alicia says her nightmare isn't over. She says she was bullied so badly after appearing on a reality TV show at just 15, airing when she was 16, that she developed crippling anxiety and is now on a cocktail of prescription meds. She says she has been hospitalized more than 50 times for panic attacks and anxiety-induced seizures. Take a look. I am on so much medication, it is like a living pharmacy. This one is to keep me stabilized so I don't panic. This one is to keep me focused for my ADHD. This one is to keep me from having seizures. This is for pain. This is so you're emotionless. This one keeps me happy, to relax my muscles, to have me sleep at night. Under the influence of drugs and alcohol, at least she's made a lot of poor decisions. Every day, it's just more and more meds, and after a while, they don't even do anything. It's sad. Another pill, another day, another problem. Yeah, 50 times you've in had to go in. the past two years, over 50 times, yes. Yeah. That is a list from hell mm -hmm. uh, to, be, uh, to, to be taking. So that has to be dealt with. Uh, let me ask you something. You said that at one point you paid a $15,000 bribe for her to win a beauty pageant? Yes. Why, why, what was your thinking in doing that? Well, Alicia liked beauty pageants so much, and we've seen the same kids winning and winning. It's like what director brought the most kids to the pageant, what hair and makeup person, or what coach would bring the most kids. And we kept saying, it's got to be, it's got to be fixed. So I contacted one of the directors, and yeah, I gave him $15,000. He gave some hair and makeup with it and some costume designs for it and also a win. And I just, for years later, it took before she even found out. And how did you feel about that when you found out about it? At first I didn't know and then when finally my parents approached me and told me the truth, $15,000, I was numb, I was shocked, but it didn't actually surprise me in a way. That's the mm -hmm. sad part. Were you spoiled before the... Before you I was. went on the TV show? I was. You were spoiled. Correct. And, um, but then you got bullied really bad afterwards. A living nightmare is not even the word. What I went through was living hell. And you say what you, how you were depicted on the show is not how you really were. No. Why did you go on that show? I thought Hollywood, oh my God. Hey, this might be my big break. We thought it would be something like a Hannah Montana. Disney, how bad could it be? Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil, a former cop. Jordan started molesting me at age eight. Accused of the unthinkable. I'm surprised that the community is rallying behind him. You're basically calling her a liar. That's tomorrow.
Why did you go on that show? Why did you decide to go on that show? Well, when she was at her dance class, um, ABC approached the, the dancing school. They wanted some kids to do a lot of activities. And so they announced at one of the meetings, anybody want to go on the show? I never even seen the show before. And we said, we'll give them our name. Alicia does a lot of activities, you know, tap, jazz, ballet, gymnastics, singing, dancing, piano, you name it. And she did it. And they came down and filmed us one day and said, we want us on the show. Uh, I understand how it happened. So it was I basically, said, we thought it would be something like a Hannah Montana, Disney, how bad could it be? Little did we know, we were shown in a really bad light. When I filmed the show, I was a child. I thought, Hollywood, oh my God. So whatever the producer said to me, yeah. I agreed. I did it how they wanted me to do it. I was acting for them. And I thought, hey, this might be my big break. Yeah. I was a child. Yeah. Um, so do you, I told you I was going to ask you if you felt like you said what you wanted to say? Have you, you feel like you've said what you wanted to say? I just want people to give me a second chance. I'm a real person. There has to be a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> I just want people to see that and realize I'm a good, I'm a sweetheart. I really am. I never, ever degrade anyone, no matter what they did or are, because I was that person who was degraded and belittled and hurt so badly. No one should have to go through that in life, ever. Well, your question for me, um, Can and, you help me? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting ready to. <laughs> and listen, do people don't always <laughs> like to hear what I have to say. And, and you may not like what I have to say right now, but I, I think you may hear it differently across time. Um, and I, I'm glad that you've told your side of this and, you know, saying that you're a real person and that you want a second chance and all you've said that four or five times which makes me know that you, you feel it passionately from the inside and so I, I feel like you have said what you wanted to say and your question for me that you, you told us in your pre-interview is how do you move on with your life how do you get how do you get past this and move on and and I want to answer that question when you load your daughter up in a car and drive her down to the gentleman's club so she can go in there and take her clothes off for money, shame on you. You know, I, I talked about Life Code, and, and Life Code is a very politically incorrect book. I talk in there about the fact that there are bad people in this world. There are. I mean, it is not just an all sunshine book. There are bad people in this world. I call them baiters. Uh, they're backstabbers, abusers, imposters, takers, exploiters. They're reckless. And we, we've, we find those people. And I, I talk in there about how you, how you spot them. How you spot them. Because they actually groom you. They find you and groom you. And, and I talk about the evil eight. There are eight characteristics that you can use to spot these people with. And, th I mean, they're arrogant and they're entitled. They'll, they'll find you. You can see how they, they come at you with this evil eight characteristics. Um, you'll see them coming down the road. They, they just jump out at you. They're arrogant and entitled. They don't have any empathy. They don't care if they hurt you. They don't care if they ruin your life. They don't have any guilt. They're irresponsible. They create drama everywhere they go. They brag about outsmarting people. They go from one relationship to another. I mean, you'll see them, and you all have them in your lives. They may be in your family. You may be married to one of them. You may be sitting next to one of them right now. You don't know. <laughs> they live in this delusional world, and they have these ways, these tactics of getting to you. You need to learn to spot those people. But there are also ways that you have to be to win. And, and, and I talk about that in the book, what you have to do to win. And Alicia, look, <clears throat> you've talked about all of these people in your life that have victimized you. And there's no doubt about that. But I, I don't want you to be victimized. I want you to be victim wise. Mm -hmm. Be smart. You need to stop blaming people for what's happened in your life. You were a child when some of this stuff started. Look. I've gone way back in your history. You were made fun of early in your life. People teased you about being fat and that sort of thing. 
I get that, that you haven't had the best role models here. I mean, both your parents have been in trouble with the law. I'm sorry, but you have. Bad role model, Mom. Right. Bad role model. You need Absolutely. to admit that to your daughter. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> but you obviously love your daughter very much, but you are making some bad decisions. When you load your daughter up in a car and drive her down to the gentleman's club so she can go in there and take her clothes off for money, and you burden her with having to take care of the family, shame on you. Shame on you for doing that. That is... That, that is a bad burden. That is a bad yeah. burden to put on a child. I'm sorry. It's a bad burden to put on a child. It is. You should say, we will live in a box under a bridge before I will ask you to go in there and demean yourself in front of a bunch of drunk, slobbering men in order for us to live in this house. You don't burden a child with that. That is wrong, and I'm sorry that that's been done to you. Mm -hmm. Your mother loves you, but she's wrong. But there's a point at which you gotta stop blaming some reality show. You gotta stop blaming some 54-year-old guy. Mm -hmm. You gotta stop blaming whoever or whatever. And you gotta say, you know what? I gotta start making some smarter choices in my life. And as you said, you, you were 15 when some of this stuff started. You are 21 now. And so you've gotta start making some choices. You know what would make people give you a second chance? When you can look them in the eye and say, you are looking at what may be, what may have been the dumbest kid to come down the street. I have made some dumb choices. I agree with that. And I have learned from that. I now take accountability for myself. I now own my decisions. I now wake up every day as an accountable adult and I will begin to, to make some smart choices in my life. And that's what you have to do. I don't apologize. I don't blame. Whatever happened, happened. That was then. This is now. And today, I'm going to start making smart decisions in my life. And you may need help in doing that. First off, these medicines worry me no end. I want, let me tell you what I want to do. Okay. I want to get you with a proper proper skilled psychoneurologist that will a psychiatrist neurologist that will evaluate you in terms of your hormones your blood and your brain to find out what in the world is going on with all of these meds because i suspect you probably need none of them i would love that okay i suspect you probably need none of them but I don't want you to quit any of them without medical supervision. That would be irresponsible. That ne you probably need to be titrated off some, if not all, of these things under medical supervision so you don't have withdrawal. Exactly. And when we take those away, then we need to give you some tools to replace those things with, to handle anxiety, to handle some of the panic, all of the things that are going on with you, and give you some of those skills. And I will make those arrangements starting immediately, even today, if possible, to get that done so you can get rid of that stuff, get some coping skills for your anxiety, and begin to make a plan for moving forward in your life. You are an intelligent, articulate, attractive young woman. You do not need that. You need to start making decisions, and you are way better than walking in a room and taking your clothes off for money. You need to stop doing that and start using your brain to do something with your life. Okay. All right, we'll be right back. Here are the top five warning signs your teen could be in trouble. Look, if your child starts to isolate from the family, it's really a sign because that's their home base. And if they start to pull back from you, that's a warning sign. Number two is there is an extreme shift in mood. Now, of course, kids bounce back and forth. But if you see an, an extreme shift and it's enduring, pay attention to that. It could mean that they are in trouble in some way. If he or she starts abusing drugs or alcohol, pay attention. They could be self-medicating themselves, not just partying. Not that that's okay, but it could be that they're medicating themselves. If there's a family history of alcoholism or drug abuse, pay particular uh, attention to that because there could be a predisposition for this to get to them. If they start taking unusual risk, because that could mean that they don't have a regard 
for their own safety. They don't have a regard for their own well-being. It's like, I don't care what happens to me. That's not just them being macho. It could mean that they just simply don't care. Now, if you feel your teen is out of control and you don't know why, log on to drphil.com. There's going to be a parenting test there to find out if maybe you're enabling that teen's bad behavior. I think maybe it might give you a, a, few, a few clues and a few suggestions on what you might want to pay attention to. I want to thank my guests for being here today and opening up about their personal stories. Uh, it's always thought-provoking, I will certainly say that. You can find me on Twitter, you can find me on Facebook, and we always are looking at the message boards on drphil.com. Thanks for being here today. So long. Thanks, guys.